this is Jim Hogue again at the house at Pooh Corner. And we have an exciting innovation happening here at Orca, which is three different people on a Skype call with me from California and New Jersey. And they're rather crucial to the events happening in our time. Uh, because they are with the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Truth, they have done petitions and supplemental petitions to the grand jury in New York City, trying to explain to them the likelihood of certain causes and results having to do with 9-11. And we will be talking to each of them who will be explaining what their different roles have been in these petitions to the grand jury. And we have Barbara Honiger, whom I met many years ago in Montpelier. She's from California. And I will tell you a little bit about Barbara. Uh, served at high-level positions in the US government, including White House policy analyst, special assistant to the assistant to the president and director of the Attorney General's Law Review at the Department of Justice from 95 to 2011. Ms. Honiger served as senior military affairs journalist at the Navy Postgraduate School. And that's, uh, she was in that position when uh, we met her here in, um, in Montpelier. And uh, the Premier Science, Technology, and National Security Affairs Graduate Research University of the Department of Defense. Her pioneering book, October Surprise, on the deep story behind the Iran side of the Iran-Contra scandal, subsequently confirmed by formerly classified documents. Um, well, anyway, you get the picture that uh, Barbara has been in the trenches for all these years regarding the truth of American activities uh, having to do with 9-11 and Iran-Contra. And we also have Richard Gage, whom I interviewed uh, several times over the many years on my radio program, which was also called The House of Pooh Corner. And Richard Gage is the head of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. And he has been focused primarily on the demolition of Building 7, but also on the techniques of demolition that had to do with Towers 1 and 2. So he's with us today. And someone I have not met, David Meiswinkle, is the president of the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Truth. And he will tell you a little bit about himself because, um, because I don't know anything. So let's start with uh, David, the, the chair and president of the Lawyers Committee, and tell us, give us a little introduction as to the petition and where that has gone with the grand jury, what the grand jury may or may, may, or may not be up to. And I'll even throw out a question right now for you. Uh, who else besides the Lawyers Committee is contributing petitions and is contributing information to the grand jury. I read that you're in partnership and with, with other, other groups, if I've understood that correctly. And it's not just the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Truth that is handling the information that goes to the grand jury. So tell us about yourself, and then if you can answer my complicated question. So go for it. Show. Uh, I am a, a licensed attorney in New Jersey since 1989, a practicing criminal defense attorney uh, for the past 10 years, and uh, I am presently the president uh, of the uh, Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry and a board member, uh, and we are a nonprofit organization. You can access us through LC4FOR911.org. I'm also a retired police officer and a, a United States Army veteran. As a police officer, I founded a community newspaper, Taxpayers and Tenants Association, which exposed local political corruption, and uh, that, that led to federal indictments of powerful local officials. And at one time, when I was in the police office, I was myself a whistleblower. I uh, have a, a number of things I can tell you, but I, I think that we take a, a valuable time, so I won't. Other than that, presently, uh, as you mentioned, there is a grand jury a petition that was submitted uh, in April of 10th of last year, 2018, mm -hmm. and uh, an amendment 
was uh, submitted. This is to the U.S. Attorney in the Southern District in New York. This is where Ground Zero is, is where the big buildings are, the big high-rises, uh, World Trade Center towers, and other uh, uh, important buildings in that complex. That's where they, that aspect of the crime happened. And in that area, uh, the uh, U.S. Attorney, uh, uh, Jeffrey Berman, he received from us a petition requesting uh, a, a grand jury investigation. It was 52 pages, and it was uh, 57 exhibits, which are very powerful. And I'm sure uh, Richard and uh, Barbara will talk about those exhibits and the uh, profoundness of them. But uh, in uh, we, we have uh, are working actually with no one other than uh, the architects and engineers on a joint fundraiser. And uh, that has been directed towards the grand jury petition to uh, further this uh, cause to uh, uh, ensure that a proper grand jury proceeding is conducted in the uh, Southern District. This will be the first time to our knowledge that ever a criminal investigation uh, into the crimes of 9-11 uh, involving the uh, controlled demolition evidence, the evidence of explosives, the e evidence of bombs is uh, being relayed now to the public and it's being supported, we like to say, dispositively or conclusively that these buildings came down not because of the official story, which was office fires or office fires caused by uh, gasoline uh, from the airplane, that's one of the buildings wasn't even hit by an airplane, but they were brought down from controlled demolition, explosives, bombs. This is a startling for many people, but the evidence is there, and as we said, it's dispositive. So we uh, are associated with architects and engineers in, in another way, too. They are the prime uh, mover for gathering this evidence since the establishment of that organization. And that organization is a is comprised of professionals, scientists, architects, etc., researchers, and they don't have an ax to grind. They're trying to present the truth, the uh, physics, the, uh, uh, the science of the crime. And uh, so we uh, take a lot of their information, their evidence that they've gathered since uh, 2006, 2007, and we've packaged it as attorneys can do, and we've now presented it in a legal form into a court of law. And the uh, under the statute 18 U.S.C. 3332, which mandates, makes it a obligation on the part of the U.S. attorney to present that evidence now to a grand jury, a special grand jury, which will be convened basically to hear the evidence. So that's the significance of architects and engineers. They've gathered the evidence at ground zero, and the significance of, of working with them now is that jointly on a fundraiser is to gather money so that we can take this grand jury petition all the way and uh, do whatever we have to do, what lawyers have to do, to ensure that this matter is being dealt with legally in the proper manner. Uh, so that's a little bit, I don't know if that answers your questions there, Jim. Mm -hmm. No, it does. Thank you. And the big news for, for those of us in the 9-11 Truth Movement who sort of began this on day one, uh, the big news is that you have presented this evidence into a format that by law has to keep going. They, Berman can't just throw it out the window, right? He, he has a legal obligation to go further with yes, it. He, he, Yes, he does. He has a legal obligation. Now, we're supplementing things, and we may get into that. Mm -hmm. Recently, they received from us, uh, from the Lawyers Committee, a uh, summary of persons, companies, and entities who may have material information related to the federal crimes of 9-11 as, as they apply to New York City. And uh, this is a fairly powerful information. Uh, it's uh, It's been done in, in two different, basically, uh, uh, presentations. One is a redacted presentation and uh, and uh, one is unredacted. And the unredacted is what the grand jury hopefully will receive from the U.S. attorney because we've asked them to convey it. And this will basically provide a roadmap for uh, the lay jurors. Uh, most of them probably 
will be startled, stunned by some of the information they'll receive and, and look for some guidance as far as how to approach it, how to connect dots and things of that nature. So we've taken that step recently uh, to submit two, two versions. One version is just for a secret, all right? And that basically is for a number of reasons, but a grand jury proceeding is secret. The other version is public, and you'll be able to access that on our uh, website, lc4for911.org, and there you'll see basically more of the, the various categories, like uh, you know, first responders that, who reported and hearing explosions, and and tenants and visitors who reported it, and uh, etc. Uh, so it's more general, and that's for a number of reasons. But that you can access on our website. All right. Well, thank you. Can you give the, the website slowly and clearly again, the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Truth? Sure. It's LC. That stands for Lawyers Committee. LC. For is the uh, spelling it out, F-O-R. Uh, so it's LC for 911.org. So L-C-F-O-R 911.org. Dot org and anyone who wants to help us uh, in this uh, joint effort is financially uh, certainly uh, please uh, access the, the website and you'll be able to do that and uh, if you have information you'll be able to contact us too if you look at and hit the uh, the button about us there'll be a, a drop down where you can contact us and share the information you have and give us your number and uh, address or name or whatever you want to do all right Thank you. Yeah, it's difficult for those of us who've followed this since day one to even imagine that there's anybody left on the planet who thinks that Osama bin Laden pulled off the 9-11 attacks, but there are millions of people out there who are in that boat, and it's hard to tell them. It's hard to get the conversation started, and I've even, I even know a PhD who looked at the demolition of Building 7, and he said, oh, that's a result of a volcanic reaction to the heat from the center of the building causing the building to collapse symmetrically. And I said, well, except that there wasn't much heat, and it wasn't in the center of the building, so um, you, you should right. probably... Right, well, Richard can answer that. Oh, yes. He can respond to that well, and I know he's done it hundreds of times throughout the world. Yes, he can he, feel that question, put that has. professor straight. All right. Well, let's go to uh, Barbara Honiger, and uh, you can tell this story from your perspective. And if you want to bring in the evidence of the, oh no, this, that's the, the Pentagon. So I was going to say that your claim to fame was the spotting the clocks that had all stopped before the attacks began. Um, but we're talking well, about... To be, fair, uh, to be fair, I have mm -hmm. a lot more than just clocks. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> yes. But anyway, that's... Washington DC and we're talking about New York City today. So right. anyway, we're only the, the grand jury petition and the petition supplement at this point mm -hmm. is only about the World Trade Center evidence. Correct. Yes. So go ahead. Uh, tell us your part in this effort. Well, um, uh, I don't believe in the intro for myself anyway that you mentioned. Maybe you did correct me. But I am on the board of the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry and an officer of the Lawyers Committee. And um, even before I joined the board, which was a little over a year ago and became an officer, um, I was also for quite a period of time before that and still um, a major researcher for the group. In other words, I do, the, I do serious, um, significant background research for the documents that you've read, the um, petition mm -hmm. and the petition supplement, um, working hand in glove with our, uh, our president, Dave Meiswinkel, you've just heard from, and uh, our litigation director, attorney Mick Harrison. So um, that's a major contribution. Also, as you know, because we're doing it right now, um, Dave Meiswinkel, myself, and Richard Gage, uh, founder and head of Architects for Engineers for 9-11 Truth, have been doing these radio shows on our joint fundraising drive for the Lawyers Committee uh, for now for a number of months, and we're continuing to do that. So we really appreciate any donations, any financial donations to support this critical, critical breakthrough work that the Lawyers Committee is doing not just for 9-11 Truth, but after over 18 years for 
justice, real 9-11 justice. As Dave Meiswinkle likes to say, we're inside the castle and uh, we have drawn up the, uh, the drawbridge, <laughs> okay? So we're inside the federal government castle, everybody. It really makes a difference. Um, so that's the gist of my involvement, but maybe you wanted to ask a more substantive question. Well, yes, uh, that's an introduction. That's a good introduction to us as to uh, who you are and what you've been up to with, with this effort. Uh, what kind of um, mandate, that's not, not the right word, um, what specifically is your contribution in terms of evidence, if you're allowed, I know you're not allowed to name names, but... Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, the, uh, my, my backgrounders, I call them my research backgrounders, are, are along with architects and engineers work that they've already done over all of these years are the major contributions to these documents. And these documents, the, the petition is uh, 52 pages long. So I, mm -hmm. uh, people just need to read the petition. Yeah. Um, and you go to our website again, lcfor911.org, and you it's obvious where you click to read the World Trade Center grand jury petition. And when you get to that petition, for anyone who isn't already an attorney or in the legal profession, I highly recommend you immediately fast forward or scroll forward to page 21, which is uh, before that, it's all the kind of legal context, mm -hmm. um, citing the statutes and all of that. Um, so page 21 begins the evidence section. And in the evidence section, uh, you will see uh, references to our evidentiary, forensic evidentiary exhibits, and those are hyperlinks within mm -hmm. the petition. So okay. you can click on any of those evidentiary exhibit hyperlinks and go straight to the um, 57 evidentiary exhibits that are, of course, part and partial of the petition. So, um, so that's important for, for people to know. Okay. Um, people just need to read the petition itself. But to more specifically answer your question, I'm, I'm very excited and actually very personally proud that I was able to succeed at this. Um, the petition features among, amongst all of the other evidence that architects and engineers, of course, has been making public for many, many years. It also features, uh, in a major way, uh, the, the critical smoking gun facts. In addition to the smoking gun of World Trade Center 7, there are two other major smoking guns that are added and featured in the petition. Mm -hmm. And that is that uh, many people don't know, even in the movement, because it hasn't been emphasized before, but it is in the petition feature, that there were massive deep basement explosions in both World Trade Centers 1 and 2, in both Twin Towers, mm -hmm. before a plane hit either tower. Now, anybody can figure out, even if they're only three years old, that it is impossible for a plane or any hijackers on a plane, even if they were on the planes, and there isn't good evidence of that even, uh, that the planes and the impacts of the planes and the fires therefrom could not have been the cause of massive explosions in the deep basements of both towers before either plane even physically hit the building. And we have in the petition the analysis and seismic evidence from the official seismic records that prove this, that 14 seconds before the plane hit the first World Trade Center tower, the first attack of 9-11. The actual first attack of 9-11 was a massive deep basement explosion in the basement of World Trade Center 2, at least at the World Trade Center 2 level or below, probably world, probably the level of basement 4 level out of 6 levels. And 17 seconds before the plane even hit the World Trade Center 2, there was a massive deep basement explosion in World Trade Center 2, and back to World Trade Center 1, there was also a massive explosion in the lobby of World Trade Center 1 that killed Bobby McIlvain, Bob McIlvain's son, as he was about to go into the glass-enclosed uh, main lobby of World Trade Center 1 mm -hmm. before the plane even hit above. So this is, these are two new critical 
well, they're not new. They've been true all along. But they are, for the first time, featured in a major way, uh, in a major document for 9-11 Truth. And now architects and engineers, Richard Gage, has done um, a very fine, approximate 15-minute video that he could tell you about about this that goes into even greater detail um, than is, that is in the uh, the grand jury petition for World Trade Centers 1, 2, and 7. Mm -hmm. So that was a major contribution that I that I made in terms of the substance, but of course there was a lot else. So that answers, should answer your yeah, question. Well, good enough. Thank you. And uh, so my next question can go right to Richard Gage, and that has to do with uh, what Barbara just said. Uh, the evidence for that uh, lasted for a long time because of the heat. And... Um, that was left in the ground, and that was observed and published and put on one video after another. Uh, so th those of us following what happened are well aware that there was something almost nuclear that must have occurred in order to maintain the heat in that space for so long. So at some point during uh, your talk, Richard, you can maybe get to how that is related to the, um, to the symmetrical collapse of the building. And one point that I like to say to people is symmetrical collapse cannot occur from asymmetrical damage. And that's awfully simple. And it's short. And it's easy for people to, to grasp. <laughs> And it doesn't always mean anything to them when it comes to real life, but it's certainly a simple concept to grasp. And uh, you're certainly in the thick of that one. So Richard Gage, who is the head of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth, and been at the nitty gritty of the chemical reactions, the physical reactions, the people on the ground, the firefighters, the first responders, and um, Silverstein, the owner, the owner of the building, Richard Gage has been part of um, that effort for a long time. So go ahead, Richard. Well, thank you, Jim. It's an honor to be on the show. I'm um, just uh, so delighted that the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry uh, saw fit to organize uh, several years ago and have been working so hard to put together the evidence that we have been assembling now for 12 years and submit it to the U.S. attorney and actually get a commitment <clears throat> on the part of the U.S. attorney to impanel a grand jury. This is the culmination of a dozen years of work of now 3,000 architects and engineers. Jim, if 3,000 architects and engineers told you that uh, wrote you a statement that said um, that your house was in danger of collapse would you listen to them <laughs> yeah i mean most of us would right this is an incredible array of of technical credibility here combining twenty five thousand years of uh of credibility and and technical proficiency so here let's Let's just put this in perspective. Uh, I mean, uh, t 12 years ago, I, I was a flag-waving Republican, uh, Reagan Republican, right? I just wanted to go and get uh, those bastards who did this to us. And, and I walk into a, a uh, uh, I, well, I'm, I'm driving my van down the road, and I, I'm hearing uh, Bonnie Faulkner describe uh, or interview David Ray Griffin on the radio, and he's talking about all these explosions that Barbara and Dave are referring to, and, but he's talking about 156 witnesses, well, 118 at the time, now 156 uh, witnesses of explosions uh, before the towers came down. We're told that these explosions, oh, that's just the sound of the tower come down, but no. But at least half of these witnesses dozens and dozens and dozens of them say no the ground is is uh shaking under my feet like a train running down there and 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 the, or i heard these explosions and then the, the tower starts coming down it's very clear the order in which these things are happening 
It's incredible. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm just blown away. I'd never heard anything like this. You know, five years after 9-11, there were no architects and engineers that were organized. So we, um, we put uh, this material together with the help of Stephen Jones, David Ray Griffin, Jim Hoffman, uh, many others, mm-hmm. uh, fine researchers back in the day who were well underway. Uh, you know, even the, the, the day after 9-11, many of them were aware. Uh, so uh, now um, we've got then Stephen Jones came out in 2006 identifying uh, the, the uh, residue of thermite that incendiary used by the military to cut through steel like a hot knife through butter. He identified this early on as uh, spheres, iron microspheres that were found in all the World Trade Center dust actually by the U.S. Geological Survey. Very clear in all their toxicological studies, they find these previously molten iron microspheres. Well, how did they get previously molten? In other words, how did they get the temperature of 2,800 degrees where iron begins to melt? How did they get to be iron uh, in all the dust samples? This, uh, This is not steel. This is the actual elemental iron. Well, iron is... Uh, one of the components, iron oxide, one of the components of of thermite. So we're talking about aluminum also, the other component. This is found in these spheres by the USGS, by R.J. Lee, but they don't identify it, the source of it. They're just confused. It's called the greatest mystery, according to the New York Times, uncovered. And then FEMA, when they produced their 2002 report on what happened at all three World Trade Center skyscrapers that collapsed that day. They In, in Appendix C, they do a metallurgical examination, a citing hot sulfur corrosion attack on the steel, liquid molten iron invading the steel. The ends of the beams partly evaporated, according to FEMA's, the FEMA author, Jonathan Barnett, a fire protection engineer. Well, how do you evaporate steel? That's 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That doesn't happen by office fires or even by jet fuel, which is just a hydrocarbon. It doesn't burn any hotter than desks or chairs. Uh, 600 degrees Fahrenheit maximum, according to its manufacturer, ME Petroleum, in open air. So where do these extremely hot temperatures come from? Pools of molten iron seen. Uh, in, by the first responders, the structural engineers, the iron workers, the firefighters are saying, li- like a volcano uh, flowing, uh, like, like uh, it, 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 I forget the exact, uh, th- it's, it's absolutely extraordinary, these quotes. The, the structural engineer of the World Trade Center himself, Leslie Robertson, uh, documents a river of steel flowing. Well, this doesn't happen until you get temperatures 2,800 degrees. Where does that come from? Thermite issues uh, molten iron at 4,000 degrees and above because there's found also by the USGS molten molybdenum. molybdenum. And this material takes 5,000 degrees to even begin to melt. So you see here we have the formation uh, more than uh, 12, about 12 years ago now of all this forensic evidence, which is damning evidence that could show exactly what happened. But then, uh, a couple of years after that, we have even more damning evidence from a team of eight engineers led by, eight uh, scientists led by Niels Harrod, Stephen Jones, and others. And and they published the results of this in a peer-reviewed paper in the Bentham Open Chemical Physics Journal. journal. They found Red, gray chips, red on one side, gray on the other. Uh, Extraordinary. They come up to a – they are attracted by a magnet. And so they determine that uh, through uh, zooming in with an electron microscope that they have nanoparticles of iron oxide and aluminum powder, the ingredients of thermite. But at the nanoscale, a thousand times smaller than the diameter of a human hair. So they get uh, really curious here and uh, determine, do some research, find that Los Alamos lab, Lawrence Livermore lab, has developed this stuff prior to 9-11,
and, and they termed it super thermite because it, it's a way to engineer incendiaries to become more explosive. So we have both incendiaries and uh, the, the uh, evidence of explosives at the World Trade Center. And so the evidence of explosives is, is key in that after four seconds, when the top of each of the Twin Towers begins to, to telescope down on itself, uh, we, four seconds after the beginning of the collapse, there's uh, the, the, the complete collapsing of the upper sections of these towers. After that, we have explosions, additional explosions heard by first responders. And then we have laterally ejected, freely flying structural steel sections weighing four tons at 80 miles an hour out of the towers laterally. That takes incredible explosive force, high energy explosives in this case landing 600 feet in every direction such that none of these these uh, steel uh, sections are found at the bottom or very few of them there's like a two-story pile is all uh, at the at the very bottom inside the perimeter and and we so so what's crushing the building if 95 percent of the structural steel is ejected well outside the footprint and by the way, the concrete floors too, 90,000 tons of concrete in each of these towers is pulverized to a fine powder and distributed throughout lower Manhattan in a three square mile area, about three inches thick. So that's not stacked up like pancakes at the bottom of what we're told is a gravitational collapse. So if, if the steel's not at the bottom of the pile and the concrete's not at the bottom of the pile what's left to crush these buildings that's most of the weight of these buildings themselves so these simple to understand intuitive uh, pieces of evidence and eyewitness and video testimony is is very revealing of what really happened here at the world trade center and guess what it's just the beginning of the content in the 57 exhibits that the grand jurors are going to see if they haven't already, their, their jaws are going to be dropped when they see all of this incredible evidence. So we're, we're ready to rock and roll. And that's why we're fundraising because the, the attorneys have to have the wherewithal to submit these amendments to the petitions, the motions to keep the U S attorney honest and, and, and the, and the additional, research that has to be done and the credit the uh, credentials of the experts have to be put together and packaged so that they can see that and call them in as experts in this crime of the century that's now in trial not trial but uh, investigate grand jury investigation mm -hmm. yeah i would like to add um, just to give a kind of a big picture frame for what richard has just given us in the evidence um, just maybe one sentence here, and uh, that is that um, what this means, all of the evidence that Richard has just presented that is in the grand jury petition, you can read on our website, lc4911.org, and that is that that is all evidence for the pre-placement, the pre-planting mm -hmm. of massive quantities of incendiaries and explosives throughout the World Trade Center Towers 1, 2, and 7, the latter not even hit by a plane, the latter having come down by classic controlled demolition, and the World Trade Center Towers 1 and 2 coming down by non-traditional, non-classic explosive controlled demolition. All of this is evidence for the pre-planting of explosives in all three buildings, which means at a very minimum, at least weeks before 9-11, they were pre-planted, if not months, which <laughs> completely, completely rules out the official story on yet another line of compelling absolute evidence that the official story cannot be true, that planes and any hijackers on the planes, that the impact of planes and fires therefrom could have possibly been the real story of what happened to destroy all three high rises. Okay. Well, at, I have a... And, and, and to follow that up, hmm. the... Uh, the hypothesis of NIST, the National Institute of Standards of Technology, 
which is basically mandated to uh, do an investigation, their investigation scientifically, they chose the least likely hypothesis that fires brought the buildings down or fires caused by airplane fuel in the uh, two of the mm-hmm. big towers. But this had never happened before, ever. Uh, fires have been in high-rise steel-structured buildings. They don't collapse uh, from fire. They can't right. because the temperatures needed to melt steel cannot be reached. You need at least another 1,000 degrees. These or to soften fire. steel. Yeah, just to clarify that point, you, 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 a softening steel, uh, which is what fire, those fires do, don't even um, – cause the collapse but as we mentioned earlier there is evidence of melted steel much higher temperatures but go ahead dave you're right on right but the uh what would normally happen jim is that the forensic evidence would be gathered at the crime scene (laughs) and uh the police would have a a protocol to do that all police officers are taught the first thing when they get in the academy is to protect the scene and to make sure that you retrieve the proper evidence before you discard it. Mm -hmm. Now, that was not done. In fact, the very valuable evidence, the iron or steel, uh, that a lot could be uh, that could be uh, uh, known from studying that steel that was uh, carted off, chopped up and sent overseas. Yeah. Thank you. Fire departments, too, would have a protocol. And one of the things they would do uh, they p- want to protect spoilation of the evidence, so they want to investigate, uh, and it would be a protocol for uh, fires, bombs, explosives, incendiaries that might be present to cause this incredible catastrophe that we have never seen before, mm-hmm. and that wasn't done. So right from the beginning, you had the uh, hypothesis being the least likely uh, that had never happened before, never happened since that fires or office fires or office fires caused by jet fuel uh, caused the buildings to collapse an impossibility and the most likely hypothesis that controlled demolition could accomplish this was never considered Mm -hmm. right well we can thank uh, mr giuliani for prohibiting a proper investigation in new york city because that seemed to be under his command but i have a, a quick question for actually maybe all three of you, um, you remember good old Mr. Manning of Fire Engineering. And uh, I, you, you know whom I'm speaking about, right? Bill Manning is the editor-in-chief of Fire Engineering magazine. Yeah, he, Fire made, his, Engineer. he made his original statement about the joke of, a, of, of an investigation. I don't remember it off the top of my head. I read it many years ago. And I did speak with David Ray Griffin. He was asking me to put some evidence together for one of his books having to do with the first-hand reports that were written up in several fire uh, magazines. And I went to the firehouse and read them and all that. Uh, but uh, can you tell us whether Mr. Manning has had any, made any contribution to the efforts that you're doing here? Oh, Bill Manning is uh, is quoted liberally throughout our um, uh, section on destruction of evidence. He said, mm-hmm. crucial evidence that could uh, answer key questions is on the slow boat to China, showing an astounding mm-hmm. ignorance of government officials to the value of a thorough scientific investigation. That's the quote. And it's worse than that. Um, uh, th- this uh, starting two weeks after 9/11, the steel was uh, moved to a and put on a barge and shipped to China for recycling, uh, for like 15 cents a pound, uh, on barges that were already ready to go. Uh, so this is an this is like uh, 150,000 tons of of steel. Mm-hmm. That it was a huge project. So this this has to be investigated as well. This is the illegal destruction of evidence in a crime scene before investigators could get their hands on it and do a proper investigation. We only have, you know, in a few sculptures uh, dotted throughout the world, uh, the the World Trade Center steel, that's all that's left. Mm -hmm. And yet uh, some of the slag from the ends of these beams has been sent to Stephen Jones. He analyzes it and finds the residue of thermite. 
right there in the sculpture, still available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have some photos that people sent me in, in my documents, too. Uh, now, I remember Giuliani, when he was questioned about this, he said, well, it's been, you know, such a horrible event. Uh, we want to kind of get it out of here as soon as we can, which is a meaningless statement in, uh, legally. And um, I don't know if you, you're probably not allowed to jeopard. I don't want to jeopardize your who's who in this uh, grand jury, but this was all public. Uh, this Giuliani business was all quite public. Can, are you uh, capable to talk a little bit about that? About his role in well, this? And yeah, what would one of the categories uh, with re in reference to the summary of, of persons and companies and entities who may have material information would include the uh, people involved with the uh, removal of evidence and basically uh, that that would be uh, suggested that the grand jury may want to look into that pers certainly that area and, and okay. start connecting some dots. Okay, so this so is that, David. That would be certainly it's a a persons who controlled the premature destruction of 9/11 evidence. Actually, if you look on our summary, which will be on our website lcfor911.org, at uh, page 23, it's uh, actually the 12th listed item that we uh, include there, that uh, there would be persons who con who controlled the premature destruction of 9-11 evidence. So uh, you could, uh, you know, mm -hmm. you could jump into it in that regard. Uh, okay. That's right. Uh, there, there may be more specifics given to the grand jury in a, uh, a secret document or a confidential document that we would present. But to the public, we would keep it uh, general in that regard. And then... Uh, you know that would be say the uh, a flag to say okay let's do some further research in that area and see who or what companies could be helpful in uh, ask at, so we're answering that question is to uh, what's the premature destruction of evidence and and why would why could that be and who authorized it and etc. Okay, and that's David talking now, right? That's right. Okay, right. We, we want to I'd match like the to pictures add, up. I'd like to add something to this discussion about the destruction of evidence that should have been saved from the crime scene at Ground Zero on 9-11 not on 9/11 and after. And that is that all of the steel was not carted away. Almost all of it was. Mm -hmm. But uh, we know that uh, a large number of twisted beams mm -hmm. and other pieces of the World Trade Center towers, perhaps also World Trade Center 7, but we know the towers were uh, stored at... Uh, Hangar 17 at JFK Airport for years, and out of that warehouse, basically, um, uh, those pieces have been distributed literally not only across the United States, but around the world. And those pieces are in monuments now mm -hmm. to the 9 11 lie all over the world, including, and Richard Gage and I drove by this, this past May, mid-May of 2018, when we were in, uh, in Brussels uh, for a joint speaking tour on 9-11, uh, on the Lawyers Committee work, um, there is one of these huge pieces of twisted uh, columns in the World Trade Center towers uh, on a pedestal in the foyer of the new NATO headquarters in Brussels, Belgium, if you can imagine, uh, a monument to the 9-11 lie. And these are all over the world. And in addition, in addition, if you could believe it, um, a large quantity, of course, not relative to China and elsewhere, it wasn't just China, but it was mostly China um, that got the steel. But a good quantity of the steel from the World Trade Center towers was melted down and turned into the bow of a new U.S. Navy ship called the USS New York, if you could imagine. It's it just sickening, isn't it? And I have some of those photos. Uh, I have some photos, if you want me to send them to you, of, uh, of the steel. You probably already got them, but um, if it would help. In, in, my, in my photo gallery, people have sent me photos of, of the steel. 
Um, so if, Please uh, forward that to me, Jim. That would be fantastic. I'll get it to the attorneys, too. Okay. You know, Jim, there was a, uh, a statement uh, uh, in the report in reference to FEMA. FEMA came and, and did an investigation prior to NIST, and one of the things they mentioned that was curious and they couldn't explain was the sulfidation of metal. And Richard probably could uh, address that because that's very important. And they wanted NIST to, to look at it or put it pointed out, and no one ever addressed it uh, because it uh, it implicates extremely high temperatures. And mm -hmm. and uh, again, Richard may want to comment on that. He's familiar with that, and also with the liquid metal that was down at ground zero, a quarter of a mile underneath the top of the buildings in the basement area. After the event happens, there's a uh, liquid uh, metal down there. Mm -hmm. Okay, and Richard, yeah, go ahead, but I also want to throw in several reports from different sources about the supposed um, gold bullion that was stored under, I don't know if it's true, but I've heard it from different sources, but go ahead, Richard, and answer um, David's point. Yes, the, fir the first responders, the iron workers, the structural engineers, they all find these these molten iron pools uh, flowing like lava, they described it. In fact, uh, the South Tower, minutes prior to its collapse, you have molten metal pouring out of the South Tower. We know mm -hmm. the temperature of molten metal by its color. This is yellow to white hot, indicating temperatures <coughs> exceeding 2,500 degrees. Well, that only happens uh, not not by jet fuel, not by fires, but by something like thermite incendiaries. And the molten metal, again, is, has been tested by physicists to to find the ingredients of of uh, iron, iron molten iron, and and then this uh, pouring molten iron also has aluminum oxide ash rising off the top of it, and these freely flying structural steel sections. Uh, shot out of the towers at 80 miles an hour, they're trailing thick white smoke clouds. Well, guess what? Steel is not flammable at uh, office fire temperatures. It doesn't It doesn't burn. You don't light a match to the steel and have it uh, just kind of burn. So what's, why are the ends of these steel beams uh, on fire? Well, this would take uh, an incendiary like thermite, which would be issuing as one of its byproducts, uh, the iron aluminum oxide ash. This is extremely important. There's a lot of evidence that Building 7 as well, which we haven't quite covered yet. This mm -hmm. building is a 47-story skyscraper, part of the World Trade Center complex, and it is about 100 yards from the North Tower. And in the afternoon of 9-11, about uh, uh, seven hours after the towers collapsed, this building, uh, after witnesses hear explosions, which we cite those those uh, those witnesses, the the building drops like a rock, straight down, uniformly, symmetrically, into its own footprint, in the exact manner of a classic controlled demolition. It falls at free fall, as fast as a bowling ball falling out of the sky. Mm -hmm. uh, symmetrically. Well, that can only happen if you remove all 80 columns at once. Yeah. If you're off by even a, a second right. in those explosions that mm -hmm. remove columns, the building will begin to yeah. fall over. It'll hang. So it's alone. Yeah. Now, there was, an eye, there was an eyewitness to the countdown, and I interviewed him, and I, I have no record of it. I'm sorry. Uh, have you heard about that? Oh, sure. This is Kevin McDonald. Patton, former Air Force medic, he's um, moved to about six blocks away from the building, and as they, because they're told the building's going to come down because it has structural damage, mm -hmm. because it had a few small scattered fires, oh, they called them large, and and so um, this building, uh, th th Kevin is listening to the radio held in the hands of a Red Cross worker, mm -hmm. and. Uh, he's he he hears three two one, and then the guy said, "Run for your life." I don't know why he said that, but then the building uh, began. He says he heard a rumbling under his feet, 
before the building came down. And then he says the building just came down and, and people started freaking out. Uh, they weren't expecting, I guess, a controlled demolition. So, yeah, that's that's incredible eyewitness testimony. And there are others as well. Mm -hmm. well the, by the way, I want to jump in here and point out that I think we have about five minutes left in the hour. Yes, that's right. Six. So okay. let's uh, <laughs> if you if you if any of you has anything that you want to round up with and as to the importance and don't hesitate to tell us again of the importance of what you are doing in terms of a petitions to the grand jury and the likelihood of well, what's the next step? Um, maybe David should tell okay. us. We should all have a closing statement. Why don't yes. we begin with Dave? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, again, for having us on, uh, this is a uh, historical development that uh, we are, as a nation, at a crossroads. If we do not address the worst crime ever uh, perpetrated against our country, that which killed at least 3,000 people and influenced the entire world, and in other parts of the world killed a million people mm -hmm. because of the, the spin on 9-11, then as the United States of America, we actually, in, in that sense, cease to exist as a, a free and democratic society. We have shrugged our responsibilities to be educated and to be vigilant. This, this scene here in, in New York City uh, is one of the aspects of 9-11, a very complicated and well thought out plan or crime, and it involves other areas too. For example, the, the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and what happened in Pennsylvania, where it, it, in Flight 93, United Flight 93, allegedly crashed. So it's, we, we, we address what the, where the evidence is right now, and this is like sort of the, the tip of the spear in the sense of, of opening up this process. As we've said, we have been now legitimized because we've been invited into the castle but and to uh, make this presentation or the well to give the information to the U.S. attorney to make that presentation to the uh, grand jury uh, unprecedented. But it is only the beginning. And people, our listeners have to realize that they've been uh, hoodwinked and they've been lied to in the in the worst possible way. And to uh, let's roll back the situation Let's protect our Constitution, and let's go uh, back now to the beginning of when this happened. And let's start to put the pieces together, connect the dots. This is a giant conspiracy, and, and again, it's, it seems to be probably well-financed and uh, well-thought-out, and it's changed the whole aspect of our operation in the world, our whole self-conception of ourselves. And uh, so it's it's really underline it. It's really important to look at it again. And you can do and you can start it by going on LCFOR for 911.org, getting familiar with this material, and uh, then uh, talk to your friends about it. And we'll all figure out as Americans how to proceed. Okay. But it's one step at a time. And this is a, a big first step legally where we are now given credibility. And let's, uh, you know, say some prayers and let it roll. Okay, Barbara Honinger, go ahead. Yes, thank you so much again for having us on the show, Jim. Uh, your show and shows like it around the country and the world are what makes a difference. Um, and as you know, nothing really happens in Washington, D.C. or in officialdom in the United States or probably anywhere unless you have what's called a pincer, I call it a pincer effect. Mm -hmm. And that is you have to come from the top down as well as the bottom up. So the grassroots knowledge and understanding of the facts and the truth that we were lied to in a Hitlerian big lie about who attacked our country on 9-11 is critical from the grassroots up, as well as the now that we are inside the castle, 
and that the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York is convening a special criminal grand jury for the evidence of the World Trade Center on 9-11. You have to go from the top down and the bottom up. Mm -hmm. And the bottom line of what we're telling everybody here is that the real perpetrators of the attacks of 9-11 at the World Trade Center and elsewhere, by the way, um, are not the ones that the government told us. The real perpetrators are still at large. They are extremely dangerous, and they can attack again if we do not succeed. Mm -hmm. So please help us. Donate to the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. You can do that by going to our website, lc4911.org, or to the Architects and Engineers website, which is ae911truth.org. If you go to um, A&E, please note that your donation is for the Lawyers Committee Grand Jury Project. Okay. Thank you so much again, Jim. Thank you. Richard, you've got a minute. <laughs> Richard Gage. Right. Well, we, we have to realize what happened uh, on 9-11, uh, after the aftermath of 9-11. We invaded two countries in which over 2 million people have been slaughtered and our own uh, civil liberties through the Patriot Act, the Military Commissions Act, the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012, uh, all s subsequently eroded our civil liberties to where today any of us can be arrested uh, merely for being associated with terrorism, which isn't even defined. We can be assassinated even tortured uh, so all of all of this it goes back to 9 11 we we've engaged in a 4.5 trillion dollar global war on terror that our grandchildren's grandchildren will still be paying for it matters it's not just a matter of of of, of old history now you know 18 years ago we're we're the, the whole society has changed our geopolitical history uh, we've achieved, uh, or they're trying to achieve, dominance in the Middle East and uh, and, and control, a control grid of surveillance, etc. Here at home, so we this 9/11 will pull the truth about 9/11 will pull the rug out from underneath the grand agenda of these perpetrators, and so we, everybody's got to do something. Act on your conscience. Get informed with this material. Hand out the DVDs. The, the, the website okay. information to everybody you know, especially every architect and engineer and lawyer that you can find. It's, right. it's imperative. we got to act now. Yeah. Thank you all for listening to The House at Pooh Corner with David uh, Moswinkel and Barbara Honiger and Richard Gage. And uh, maybe we'll do this again.